Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Hi folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, up to shenanigans once again of Cosmic Proportions. Now today, I know, so, I, know, I know that we said we were going to talk about A. Merritt and some of his work, but um, I changed my mind. Today we're going to talk about my novel, Thrall, and how I think it fits under the category of cosmic horror, and how I think monsters play a role in cosmic horror. Now. Normally, I'm more inclined to talk about other authors' works on this podcast. It, may, it makes me feel a little weird to talk about my own stuff. But I'm choosing to do so this week for two reasons. One, some folks have asked me to, which I think is very nice. And I, am, I aim to please. I am a people pleaser. Two, uh, Brian was recently in an accident where he was badly burned. And between that and a very tight novel deadline that I have coming up, to be honest, I just figured that I could save time on research and reserve some mental power if I spoke to you about a book I already know intimately. So I picked Thrall because I think of all the works that I've done, Thrall probably falls under cosmic horror, at least novel length works, probably the easiest. And it's also one of my favorite novels. Of anything I've ever written, it's my favorite novel. So where do we start? Well. I didn't set out to write a cosmic horror novel per se, only because I don't think I really was fully aware of it being the subgenre that it is with the kind of breadth and scope that it has. Back then I didn't really know that. I knew about Lovecraft and I knew there were stories that I liked, stories like John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, you know, things like that. Uh, love, the, way, the way Lovecraft told the story, which to me was different uh, than the way other horror writers would tell a story, but I didn't really understand that it was a whole subgenre in and of itself. So, to me, when I wrote Thrall, it was a story about desperation. It was about the unconditional and undeniable love that parents have or should have for their children, and how that love can make a person better than he or she is. Ideally, more heroic, braver, more mature, more res responsible, and more selfless. It's the kind of, it was a story about the kind of father that my son never had. A father that would go to the ends of hell to protect his child or to save him or her from danger. Uh, I couldn't give my son that in real life. So I made a story about it. I gave it to him that way. And of course, it was, it's a story to me about monsters. See, I considered myself a writer of monster stories back then. Uh, that's kind of how I, I saw what I did. And the framework of Thrall is, to me, a kind of ultimate monster story. Uh, it's about monsters that are so enormous and powerful as to be indifferent to the worlds and people that it destroys. It's so alien in its form and motivation as to be unrecognizable to us for what it is. And it's a thing that changes everything irrevocably, uh, which I think is, in essence, I was writing about a cosmic horror monster, a thing from another dimension that crosses space and time to prey on the sentient life forms of other worlds like a giant Venus flytrap. And once I had established that kind of monster as my great cosmic beast, then I had it reflect nature, but reflect it in that twisted funhouse mirror way which all great cosmic horror, and actually all monster horror in general, does. It looks at the beauty of creation, and it turns it inside out. There is either perversion in the existence of something, or the creation of something, or conversely, there's horror in the destruction of it, to make way for new and blasphemous creation. And that's kind of the case, that's kind of the case with Thrall. Now, to me, monsters only work even just as symbols for other things, which is really what they are in, in horror novels. Uh, if they breathe and threaten to squirm or slither or crawl or lumber right off the page. And for that to happen, 
they need their own biology, their own logic, their own laws of physics, their own behavior patterns, their social groups. You actually have to treat monsters as characters, as, as living, breathing beings for, you know, I mean, they don't always have to be living or breathing, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, now, and these things have to make sense to you enough that you're conveying it to the reader that whatever their laws of biology and physics and uh, psychology are, no matter how different than ours that might be, that it still exists there as, as a guiding force with the monsters that you're creating. Uh, nature has fractals. I remember thinking that was sort of fascinating because I always thought fractals was a math thing, and it is. But it's because nature has fractals, things inside of things, inside of things, inside of things, a sort of endless pattern. Um, nature has symbiotic relationships, which may appear horrible to us on the outside, but work for the creatures that have this symbiotic relationship. And of course, nature has predators, which is a major driving force of fear going all the way back to caveman times. When I created the Monsters in Thrall, I worked monsters inside of monsters inside of monsters. There are things which live and have either a predatory or a symbiotic relationship with the monsters themselves. In fact, the actual framework of Thrall is that it is a monster carrying monsters which carry monsters. Uh, I had monsters preying on other monsters. Not all the monsters in Thrall get along with each other. Some of them fight. Uh, and on the fringe of that, of course, I try to include the monstrous things that people do to survive. And monstrous doesn't always have to be synonymous with evil. A lot of times it is, because the connotation of a monster is something, um, something whose behavior is bestial and, and primitive and, and primal, but often violent. I mean, there's that sort of violent connotation to it. But nature is violent, and it's not evil. It's indifferent. And we've had that conversation before when we've talked about other stories. It's kind of the same thing here. Monsters, most monster stories, if you look at true monster stories and not humanoid vampires, werewolves, whatnots, but monster stories, most monsters behave like beasts. They behave like animals. Uh, that, that may or may not be evil, but it's, it's definitely primal. It's definitely violent. Um, really, and I don't know what that says about us, but really evil comes when there's a level of sentience, a level of uh, self-awareness and the ability to think. Um, and sometimes people do bad things for good reasons. You know, sometimes that's the only way to survive. And that's, that's sort of one, one sort of inherent thing in, uh, in Thrall. If you look at cosmic horror in general, there's the idea that sometimes bad things are done for noble ends or in the pursuit of science or the pursuit of knowledge or education. You could say that that's, that's a version of that, but um, I'm not so sure that people are as willing to be forgiving of that as they are, say, of doing what you have to do to survive, to stay alive. Still, I recognize now that the monsters of Thrall are both more physical than traditional cosmic horror monsters. There is a very much an element of biology to these things, um, but also just as strange, just as strangely formed, just as alien in their thinking. Uh, and I took some time with that because I feel that describing monsters is important. Uh, I'm a very visual person. Uh, and one of the things about cosmic horror that I don't know. I guess it lends a sort of dreamlike quality to the kind of story, but it also, I think it also undercuts the, the visceral horror of cosmic horror sometimes is this, you know, this idea of, of not really being able to describe something because it's so alien in its appearance. It's so unlike anything we've ever seen. It's like trying to describe a color that a person can, can't see. Uh, I try to describe the monster so that readers could picture what they look like because I believed that their substantiality, their, their very texture, their smell, the sound of them, um, their very realness was important to me. I believe that monsters can still be part of the great unknowable 
and yet be very real to the senses. And in fact, I believe there's something more horrific about them when they are. They don't have to be things which cannot be described, all in caps, of course, um, in order to evoke the same sense of strangeness or alien coldness or utterly inhuman power that we see in cosmic horror, particularly if we use the stark contrast of their vivid realness and their very real actions versus their completely unknowable motivations and feelings. Now, we could have a whole conversation about um, the kind of monster that is developed when you go inside its head and the kind of monster that is developed when you stay outside of its head. Um, that's a discussion for another day because basically both have strengths that result in a specific approach to the kind of horror or the development of a set of themes that you want to include in a story. But for the context of this discussion, I think modern cosmic horror, modern cosmic horror, creates monsters that are less dreamlike and more visceral, but just as terrifying in their utter indifference and alienness to us. And I think that's important because we have nowadays more of a jaded audience. They're not going to really be satisfied by or affected by, oh, it was too horrible for me to tell you. Tell me, tell me what is horrible about it and make me understand why I should be horrified by it. And I think that's, the, that's a trend of, of modern cosmic horror in that we finally get to describe that which cannot be described. The monsters in cosmic horror are often, in my opinion, symbols for, in particular, madness, a yearning for power, or culmination of knowledge. Now, there's a kind of hopeless futility in fighting them which I think often reflects the hopeless futility of fighting illness, let's say, or natural disaster, or even death itself, that we're faced with these things that are bigger than us, and you can try to fight them, but you're not going to get anywhere, and you know that going in. It's kind of a very bleak look at the world, but that's the way cosmic horror is. And I think if you only look at it superficially, um, then what, you're, what you end up doing is extrapolate that everything we do is pointless, because in the face of, of these forces that are stronger than us, it doesn't matter um, that we only get up in the morning because biologically we're programmed to do so or because we haven't reached a point where we choose not to get up in the morning, you know. And that's a very dark way of looking at the world. However, I think there's this thread of human pride in cosmic horror. And I think it goes at least, I definitely think it predated Lovecraft and post-dated Lovecraft. But I think that it's in Lovecraft's work, too, for as nihilistic as it comes across. And I'm not even sure he was consciously aware of it. But he spoke very proudly of people. Now, granted, he spoke very proudly of people that he perceived to be like him. He spoke very negatively of people that he thought were outside his sort of charm circle of New England life here. But... There, there is, you can tell from his letters, you can tell from um, some of his nonfiction writing and even some of his fiction writing that there's, there's a pride in being a human being and being an, an intelligent and, and sentient life form that I think it, it, there, it's an un, that undercurrent is in his work. It's in his stories. I think that a lot of times the pride is to be inferred rather than directly handed to us. But it's the idea that despite the knowledge of insurmountable odds, human beings are going to human anyway. They're going to persevere anyway. They're going to fight without knowing if they'll win just because the fight is important. Uh, that human souls and all the knowledge and experience and understanding of the universe that they have collected over time, all of that, it's valuable and it's worth fighting for. And I think that that influenced me more than I was consciously aware of. Because in most of my books, and in Thrall in particular, it's a major theme. The characters in that book kind of expect to die. They don't expect that anything is going to come of the fight. They think the odds are too great. But it never stops them from fighting anyway for things that they believe are greater than they are. Things like love, innocence, a chance for happiness and security, and loyalty. Those things transcend. And I strongly believed, and still do, that the heart of any horror story is the arc of human reaction and behavior to trauma or tragedy. How, in my opinion, people become bigger than life or better than themselves, or in some cases, how they deconstruct and fall apart. Sometimes they become worse 
than themselves or they become shades of what they used to be. I'd venture to say that cosmic horror examines that very aspect, but it takes a more cynical approach than perhaps my naive and optimistic self at the age when I wrote that book uh, subscribed to. If you look at my main character, Jesse, okay, other than his being a loner, I wouldn't say he fits all the criteria of a Lovecraftian hero or even a villain, but he does have some social issues, like a lot of Lovecraftian heroes. Um, he has trouble deeply connecting to others. Now, I'm told that Lovecraft himself, despite what people think, did not have trouble deeply connecting to others, but that certainly comes through in his characters. His characters do have trouble maintaining any kind of intimate relationship or any real understanding of the social cues that allow intimacy. Um, and Jesse does have that. I suppose that, you know, there is an influence on that. I, I would have said at the time that it had more to do with the kind of boys, I guess, that I was attracted to, the kind of boys that I felt I knew and understood well. But really, he is that kind of character. Um, he does understand that what he's always known about his hometown of Thrall and what it is, that he can never unknow that and that he can never undo the damage that firsthand knowledge of his hometown has caused him and probably the people around him. And he sacrifices almost everything first to get away from knowledge. Now, at first that sounds like it would be antithetical to a Lovecraftian story where there's always that, that person poring over books in a library for a quest for knowledge. But I'd like to differentiate between a Lovecraftian narrator, perhaps, and a Lovecraftian main character. The main characters are often people, the people the story is about, are often people who have this uh, quest for knowledge that they refuse to deviate from. Jesse in the beginning is kind of the opposite of that. He's more like the narrators, who in a lot of cases are secondary characters, who would almost do anything to avoid that knowledge or to put it away, to put it back. These are the characters at the end of Lovecraftian stories who, you know, throw the shining trapezohedron into the lake, you know, to, into the bay to avoid anyone else ever finding it, or who burn, you know, their copy of the Necronomicon to make sure, or, or tear up somebody else's papers and burn them to make sure nobody ever gets their hands on this knowledge and correlates all of these events. Jesse's kind of doing that, although I wouldn't say that the character at that point in his life was really smart enough to destroy anything about Thrall. He just wanted to get away from it. However, when new knowledge is given to him, knowledge that he can't forget that he knows, which is namely that he has a child, um, then he sacrifices almost everything to explore that new knowledge, to, to satisfy for himself the questions that he has, the answers that he needs about whether or not his child is still there and whether or not um, he can save her and get her out of that town. He's reckless in his pursuit of that knowledge and also wholly devoted to it. And those two traits, I believe, are often seen in cosmic horror characters. This reckless pursuit of knowledge because of, a, of an extreme devotion and dedication to exploring it. Uh, one last thing I wanted to touch on uh, about Thrall, in keeping with cosmic horror character tropes and the naughty ways that we often twist them, as far as madness goes, I definitely think Thrall has that in spades. Uh, there's a, at least one main character, Carpenter, who, yes, in case people, uh, people have asked me, and in, in case you're wondering, yes, um, I was a huge John Carpenter fan, so Carpenter's named after John Carpenter. Um, Carpenter's absolutely crazy. I mean, there's kind of no bones about that. That's, that's clear from the beginning of the book. But he's a functioning kind of crazy, sort of. And I think that's only because his survival instinct slightly overpowers or outweighs his insanity. Um, he is basically living alone. We're not sure where he's living or what he's living off of or how he can come and go from Thrall in ways that nobody else seems to be able to. But he's clearly crazy. And you find out later in the book that he's got good reason to be. But um, it's definitely 
uh, a primary aspect of his character. However, it's also suggested that everyone who currently lives in Thrall is to some degree insane. Uh, this would include Tom, Tom Wyatt, who is Jesse's best friend. Um, and there are little things, maybe, he's maybe not as crazy as Carpenter, but there are little things that he says and, do, and does throughout the book that show a certain level of imbalance from having lived there. Some of the other minor characters that you meet along the way are also in varying degrees of crazy because you can't live in a place like that and not be affected by it. And that's the point. You're breathing that air, you're drinking that water, you're eating whatever food is available in that town. It's going to get inside you. And I think it's safe to say that their madness is directly related to the knowledge that they have about their town and the entities that are to them as powerful as gods and these other dimensions from which they come. Um, I did say that was the last, there is one other point I want to make. Uh, a lot of cosmic horror in general, because I think that Lovecraft was such a scholar, I think he tended to work in these, these sort of ancient tomes of knowledge, these grimoires, if you will, of, uh, you know, ancient spells, ancient esoteric, you know, universal truths, right? I didn't have any of that. And I blame fellow writer Nick Kaufman for that because right as I was writing this novel, he made some, some comment about how a lot of horror relies on that as sort of an easy way out to explain everything that's going on. It's like somebody finds a book about it, you know? So I couldn't do that. So I tried to think of all the other ways that I could have the monsters convey what they were uh, through the book without a Necronomicon. Now there's a library, there are books. There's a whole scene actually in a library, um, including the reading of a particular book, but it, it, it doesn't really shed much light on what thrall is or, or what's going on there. I have graffiti. The the graffiti is a clue. Anytime there's graffiti in thrall, it's usually significant. It usually means something about what thrall is or what's going on there. Uh, I have a, an art gallery. They, they go to a museum at one point and there's an art gallery and there are paintings. And if you're one of those people that likes little tie in trivia, um, in subsequent books, I've mentioned the Hollowers and I've mentioned the Scions of Thrall. There's a painting in Thrall that one of the character finds, uh, which I believe was titled something like Scion, this world is yours. The Scion, Scion is the word that interdimensional beings use for the monster that Thrall is. Okay. Um, so that's a little tidbit there for people who like that kind of, uh, that kind of, you know, trivia type stuff. Uh, but there are a number of things either in paintings or graffiti or little passages in books, little notes to each other that um, essentially are clues as to what's going on. However, I, I think that I did the opposite maybe of what, uh, especially in Call of Cthulhu, uh, uh, what the narrator, you know, he says that what he hopes will never happen. I did that thing. Uh, I had the characters correlate events. I had them theorize. I had them talking to each other and all the little things that I had to work out about what would essentially be almost a post-apocalyptic scenario, but contained in a very s small space comparatively, if you're looking at a whole planet, um, all of those things, how and why, like how the fact that these people could live for years and not run out of food because food just keeps magically showing up there. Um, I have them talk about it. I have them discuss, you know, possibilities. Well, maybe it means this, or maybe it means this. And honestly, some of the truest information comes from the people who are craziest in the book because they have nothing left. They have no filters left. They have nothing left to worry about that's going to color their perception of anything. Things are the way they are and they're okay with that. Um, I think that if I had to categorize it, I, I would I would categorize Thrall as a cosmic horror novel. I wouldn't have then only because I didn't know that I could have. 
but I would now. I think it. I think it fits a lot of the criteria. I think that um, it also breaks a lot of the rules, but still keeps them at the same time. It just sort of. I should say maybe it bends them more than breaks them, uh, because I think that's what. As I've said it in other episodes, I think that's what modern cosmic horror does. I think it it takes a lot of things that we've come to think of almost as a trope in horror and particularly in cosmic horror, and it, re, it revitalizes them and reinvigorates them and makes them scary again. Uh, it's not your grandpa's horror, to put it you know to put it one way. It's it's still a, a vibrant and scary kind of of subgenre and i'd like to think that that thrall fits pretty well into that i don't know you guys can you know, read the book and and judge for yourselves whether or not i was successful in in accomplishing what i what i set out to do but um that's why i think that thrall fits into cosmic horror and i it, it, those are the kinds of stories i want to tell stories with monsters for the most part um stories about worlds beyond ours and mostly stories about people who, when, when it's really, when like the screws are really put to them, they become something else. They become something more. Uh, I believe that people are intrinsically heroic and sometimes the world does its damnedest to prove me wrong, but there are times where I think it, it, you could be proud of the human race. And I, and I'd like to think that sometimes I can work a little bit of that into my books, you know, um, there may be monsters, but, and it may seem like it's, you know, they're monsters. You, it, it's a fight you can't win, but it's still worth fighting it anyway. So that's all I have for this week. I do have, um, an ad. If you would like to advertise on cosmic shenanigans and be a part of the madness that is me, uh, talking about all kinds of cosmic craziness, uh, then send Armand Rosamilia uh, an email. You can do that if you go to sh the Shenanigans Cosmic Shenanigans webpage uh, on Project Entertainment Network. I believe there's a button there. Rather than try and spell out his email address every week, I think if you just click the button, like you know, sub that you can that you can uh, do an ad. It's probably a lot easier for you to do it that way. Today's ad comes from, uh, th and this book, I'm, I'm excited about this book. This sounds, this sounds pretty awesome. It's called Tim E. Less. Now, Tim isn't a perfect man. He's not the perfect husband or father. He's a guy struggling to provide for his family. And no matter how hard he tries, it's all falling apart. When it looks like things can't get any worse, the accident happens. Tim can't remember a thing, only the sound of twisting metal, of the nightmares, and of coyotes stalking him through the halls of Stillwaters. The doctors are lying, hiding behind false and stolen faces. See, I'm already one over. I love stolen faces. Tim and the other patients are their prisoners. Or is it all in his head? If only he could just remember. Follow Tim on his downward spiral through the asylum, through hell and back, as he uncovers the truth of what happened to his family. Tim E. Less is a disturbed horror thriller of insanity, chemical seduction, and true nightmares come to life. It's Silent Hill meets The Cell. I'm so sold just on that. Uh, sometimes the real horror is remembering. And if, if, if this whole description doesn't fit perfectly into what we were talking about, perfectly into the cosmic horror framework, I don't know what does. This is Tim E. Less by Lucas Milliron. It's available on Amazon, Kindle, and paperback right now. So go get it. You're going to love it. And that's it for this week. Thanks again to Dave Thomas, who is back and, and doing Dave Thomasy things for cosmic shenanigans, <laughs> engineering type things, doing all the things. He's awesome. And he's doing Twitch, uh, which is Twitch slash Meteor Notes TV. Did I do that right? No, I didn't do that right. Twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. Twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. Don't mess it up like me. Do it right. <laughs> do it right. Twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. You can watch him play games. You can learn all about Bert's plans for World Takeover because it will happen. Uh, you can also, of course, if uh, listen to me and Brian and Dave on the horror show with Brian Keene. Uh, 
Brian is healing nicely and new episodes are forthcoming. So you give that a check. You can check that out the same place you check out Cosmic Shenanigans. It's on the Project Entertainment Network, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. If you would like to advertise on Cosmic Shenanigans, once again, like I said, go to the Project Entertainment Network website and find the little button. I believe it's in the upper right hand corner. I could be wrong about that, but there is an option to contact Armand about doing ads. And as always, you can check out past episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans, future episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans, and all the episodes in between for free, always for free, on Project Entertainment Network, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, and all other platforms. We have reached officially the 15th episode. I'm not sure that that's an anniversary, but woohoo for us! Yay! Um, waving tentacles in the air. And more next week, okay? Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Entertainment Network presents The Mondo Method. An old man with a goatee teaches a younger guy with a beard how to write. Introducing first, he's the mentor and the greatest manager of all time, Mondo Guerrero. And from parts unknown, up-and-coming superstar, The Great Buddha. Okay, so maybe the names are really just Armand Rosamilia and Chuck Buddha, and maybe you'll learn something while they're at it. Wednesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.